Good morning, everybody. I want to start by saying Jesus loves you. We're, okay, good. I didn't even get an amen from Phil. Come on, that's why. If I'm not getting an amen on that, then this is not going to be good. But um, it's great to see everybody this morning. Very glad that you are here this morning. It's awesome to see you. I want to do something just a little bit different <clears throat> to start out this morning. I want to go ahead and offer the invitation. And I'm not going to say come down if you need it, but I want to go ahead and, and say the spiel because I feel like at the end of sermons sometimes when, when we start offering the invitation, that's uh, also known as pack up your Bible and get going and stuff. So I'm not going to give you the opportunity to do that. We're going to end. You're going to be like, whoa, I caught off guard. I'm going to pack up my Bible when we're done. But this morning at the conclusion of the sermon, if there's anything we can help you with, we'd, we'd like to invite you to come uh, when we sing our invitation song. If you need to be baptized into Christ, if you need to become a Christian today, we would love to make that the day. If you need the prayers of the church uh, in any way, if you're struggling, if you are hurting, if you're mourning and, and need us to pray for you, we would love for you to come forward and do that um, also at the conclusion of our sermon. So know that if there's anything we can help you with, please come. So I want to start <clears throat> this morning by, I want you to think of your comfy place, your most comfortable place that you like to sit, that you, where are, I just put my notes somewhere, I can't find them. So think of your comfortable place. For me, it's, it's my chair, okay? It's my recliner that when I get home and when I'm at home, uh, watching TV or playing video games, um, I got a nice, big, plushy, comfy recliner that um, that we just got a couple years ago, so it's still fairly new. Uh, my last recliner was broken, and it was kind of like the gear was messed up, so it's sideways and cranky. Um, but I like my comfy chair, okay? And I think um, <clears throat> you've got somewhere comfortable too, whether it's a, a spot at your home, whether it's a, a place, or maybe even people that, that make you feel comfortable. I want you to think, I want you to think of, your, of your comfy spot. Um, <clears throat> also, maybe if you're interested in doing a quick exercise this morning, I want you to find the word comfortable in the Bible. And, and as I'm continuing to talk right now, uh, tell me if you find it, or I'll, I'll ask for a show of hands in a minute. But if you're interested, if you want a little uh, challenge to start, look for the word comfort comfortable in the Bible. All right, so you've got your nice comfy place in mind. You've got your chair, your bed, your couch, your family, the temperature. Now think of the most, think of an uncomfortable place. So when I was thinking in my mind about an uncomfortable place or, excuse me, you ever been in an uncomfortable position or with uncomfortable people, someone who you really maybe not want, don't want to talk to or it's just very awkward. Um, so I thought of my uncomfortable place and we play a game at Bible, at Bible camp called Manhunt. And the object of Manhunt is to hunt men in case you didn't catch that. Um, but you don't want to get caught, okay? You want to hide. You want to... to not be found by anybody, especially these, these campers. I mean, it's kind of scary when you've got 20 to 30 elementary teenagers rushing at you and charging you and wanting to find you. It's kind of intimidating. So I, I've thought of times where I've, I've hid. I've hidden before between dirt and a bench, kind of on an embankment with spiders and uh, and pine, cone, and, and pine needles sticking me, not knowing if this is the black widow that's going to bite me and end my life or not. But you know what? Nobody's going to find me. Um, this pa I'm not, mm, not going to say that one because there's people in the audience who will hear and find me. Um, before, I've hidden under pieces of plywood about 10 feet in the air that were, that were on me. And I, I couldn't breathe too big because the plywood would move and people would see that. And all these, both of these situations are also when it's 90 degrees outside. Very uncomfortable situations. But now that you've kind of got these two mental images in your, in your mind, you, you think of your most comfortable place, and you also think of a, of a very uncomfortable position or a very uncomfortable place that you can be in. <clears throat> so we get to the example, find comfortable in the Bible. Anybody find it? Show of hands. All right, good. I win. At least from my studies, I have not found the word comfortable in the Bible. There's comfort. Sometimes I've done this exercise before with the teenagers. And they're like, oh, does comfort? Nope, comfort doesn't count because God is the God of all comfort. Maybe not the God of all comfortability. 
um, different words. But I, can't, I haven't found the word comfortable in the Bible, at least not used in the, in the sake that, that we are talking about it this, this morning. <clears throat> so I want you to think about where you are right now. Church is comfortable for us, okay? We're all in padded pews. Now, I know everybody may not think that pews are the most comfortable piece of furniture in the world, but they're comfortable, okay? We're in comfortable pews. We know when to be here, 9 o'clock Sunday morning, 10 o'clock Bible class, 6 o'clock Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, or 6 o'clock Sunday night, 7 o'clock Wednesday night. We know when to be here. We know what's supposed to go on. We typically know the order of worship. We know these things that are about to happen. We listen. We go through the motions. We sing. We partake of the Lord's Supper. We pray together. We say amen, and we leave. Hopefully, you're going to Bible class after this, because that's very important as well but when when it's all said and done you leave you go home you say that was nice do we think about what we're singing do we think about what Christ did for us on the cross during the Lord's Supper do we actually take what we hear right now and apply it to our lives do we talk about it as families um, I know I'm very guilty of sometimes I'll think the next day what did Stephen talk about I don't know no offense to him, it's not Stephen, but it's human nature, right? Sometimes we don't remember what the sermon was about the next day, maybe not even that night. So we come here, it's comfortable, we go through the motions, and we leave. What about the early church? Does the, does the way we do church today look like the early church? And, and we're not going to read each of these passages uh, line by line, but a couple of observations that I made. Um, one thing that the early church endured that we do not endure is, is persecution. You may say, whoa, Rob, wait a second. We are persecuted. We are hurt. Yeah, to a degree. I'm not going to say that a lot of people are not against the church. But I haven't seen anybody in Murray, Kentucky lately uh, be hung, be beheaded, be thrown into a coliseum, you name it. It's a different type of persecution. Christians, we have it easy today. It says in Acts that they were scattered about everywhere, that in this particular passage, Saul was ravaging the church, going door to door, dragging people out who followed Jesus. I don't, again, I don't see it happening right here and right here today. They met daily. Gosh, can you imagine what the elder said? We're going to start meeting every evening at 6 o'clock. There would be a riot. It would be, what about my time? We have things to do. We have this or that. But they met daily. And it's interesting to note that the verse after this, in verse 47 of Acts chapter 2, it says that the church was growing daily as well because they were meeting, they were breaking bread, and they were worshiping and so on. And as a result, they were also growing day by day. They helped each other and they shared. These two passages or these two examples are very similar. Um, but it says that there was no needy person among them. That they were helping each other. That they were making sure everybody um, who was in need, they were selling their possessions. They were taking care of each other. And I think, I think we do a pretty good job of that. I think there's always room for improvement. And, and they longed for the word. It says in Acts chapter 2, verses in verse 42 and 46. <clears throat> it says, They continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. It said also that the continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. They were longing for the word. They were meeting daily to talk about it, to worship together, to sit at the apostles' feet and learn. Do we have that kind of longing? Do we have, as Jesus says in Matthew 5, verse 6, do we hunger and thirst for righteousness? I love that verse because it's something I'm always uh, striving for, striving to attain, because I know I do not hunger and thirst for the word as, as I need to, as I'd like to, as, as I want food and drink. That's how we need the word of God. So was Jesus comfortable? Because throughout Jesus' ministry, and this, this doesn't even touch right here on what he endured for you and me on the cross. This is, this is his life. It says that we, we read several times where the, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, they sought to take his life. They sought to destroy him. And he was living with that at, throughout his ministry. He was rejected by his own home. 
uh, it says a prophet is, is not without honor except in his own home. That people where he was from didn't even really regard him as anything special. Uh, we read when, when he's telling people to follow him and they're giving, these, his, these, giving him these excuses. He says, I, I have no place to lay my head. You know, the son of man has no place to lay his head. And we see that in three years of ministry, Jesus is always traveling. He's always going about. So I, I know I don't believe that Jesus had a house that he went to every weekend, his own home to call and relax and sit in his comfy chair. I, it, it appears that he was on the go often, always moving about preaching and serving. We don't, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't see where Jesus went to the Sea of Galilee for a three-day vacation. Amen, Johnny Miller? It doesn't say where he, it says he went away by himself or he went away to a quiet place, but it was to pray. It was to meditate. It was, it was between him and the Father because he's always about moving, preaching, and everywhere you see he's serving, he is helping those in need. I think the Bible has a relatable term for comfortable, and I think it's, it's lukewarm. I, w- I wouldn't like to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 3. <clears throat> in Revelation chapter 3, 2 and 3, Jesus is, is giving these warnings to several churches and, and saying, you're doing good in this, but, or you need, you're, you're awesome in this, continue in this, but I need you to do this. And in Revelation chapter 3, beginning um, in verse 14, it reads, And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, what's that big word? Laodiceans. Thank you, Stephen. Man, he's smart. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, all right, these things says the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten." Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him. And he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. (coughs) Excuse me, my throat is acting up. Lukewarm. It's not too hot. It's not too cold, right? I, I would say lukewarm is comfortable, at least temperature-wise. Our, our house, depending on who's touched the thermostat last, is either typically 70 or 72. That's comfortable for me. 70 is a little cold for me. I'm, a, I'm from South Alabama. But that's still, it's not too warm. It's not too cold. It's, it's comfortable. It's lukewarm, okay? So Jesus says, if you're lukewarm, I will vomit you out of my mouth. And yes, I have the word vomited up here several times because when we hear vomit, it's not a comfortable word. It's not a word that we really like to say, but I want this, I want you to get this picture. I want you to understand what Jesus, I didn't say it first. Jesus says here, he says, I know your works. You're neither cold or hot. You you either, you're, you don't care or you either, or you don't not care. You're somewhere in between. Okay. You're going with the flow. He says, I wish you were cold or hot because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Some translations say spit. I like vomit because I, I checked with my medical wife this morning. When you vomit, it says get something out that should not be there. It's to, it's to ex, expose something that is bad for you, that is not part of your body, to get it out because it's causing a problem. And Jesus says right here, if you are comfortable, if you are lukewarm, I'm going to get you out because you're no good. You're, you're causing more problems than you are good. So, so what is the remedy? He says, be zealous and repent. I like the word zealous. It's not a word that we use a lot of times in, in our daily life. At least it's not me. When I think of zealous, I think excited. I think enthusiastic and ready to go get it and repent. He says, change the way you're doing. You need to be cold or you're hot. And, and he says, be zealous. I don't think you can be cold and be zealous. So he's encouraging the church here to be excited about your faith, to be on fire, to be hot and to get 
out from being comfortable. So what are we doing with our own lives on a daily basis? What are we doing as a church <clears throat> on a daily basis? And, and this is a question, the, the first one is a question only you can ask. Day by day, how are you sharing your faith? How are you loving others? How are you serving others? Because I think a lot of times in our lives we say, I'm a good person or I live by the Bible and that's all I need to do. As, as long as people know that I'm a good person, that's what Jesus wants. Yeah, you, you've absolutely got to be living faithfully. You've absolutely got to be doing what's right in the sight of God. But our faith should drive us to action. This was actually our retreat theme a year ago, action-packed faith. Now, on a daily basis, we have got to be sharing. We, we've got to be sharing our faith. We've got to be actually loving and serving and helping others. Only you can answer that about yourself. But as a church, on a daily basis, how are we serving our community? How are we getting up, being active and doing what we can. We have the Caring and Sharing building, Rob. You're absolutely right. We do. And for those who work in Caring and Sharing, I appreciate you. You're awesome. And keep it up. But I will be the first in here to say that I have not helped with Caring and Sharing as much as I could have. And I think it's not a stretch to say a lot of us could say the same thing. We have our Caring and Sharing building, this awesome outreach opportunity, this awesome thing. And what, what are we doing to support it? What are we doing to help that way? And let's take out the Caring and Sharing building. If we didn't have the Caring and Sharing building on a daily basis, what is the Glendale Road Church of Christ doing to serve our community? What are we doing to reach and to seek and to save the lost? Because I don't know what's going on at school. I don't know what's going on at work. But we have a job to do to go out and help. Because... James says, so also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Faith takes action. And unless you're one of those weird CrossFit people, work takes energy and effort, and these aren't exactly comfortable things. You ever met a CrossFit person? They, it's, it's a cult, okay? If you're in it, we can talk later. I apologize if it offends you. But they are always, workout, workout, yeah, get in the system, woo. But to normal people, working out and exerting energy it's not always the most pleasurable thing, right? It's uncomfortable. I wish I worked out more, but I don't because my comfy chair, all right? The comfy chair is better than working out and being active and physical. But what James is saying right here is that we, in our faith has to have this action, and this action has to have energy and effort, which is a lot of times uncomfortable. And I think that's a big reason we are not doing as much as we can with our faith, because it makes us uncomfortable. Rob, I've got to use my time. Rob, I've got to use my energy. Yeah, and this is Rob talking to Rob because Rob could do a whole lot more. Rob could exert a lot more energy for the kingdom and do a lot more with my faith and go out and seek and save the lost. But it's hard, okay? And, and, our, and our energy... Is, is ours, right? At the, end of a, at the end of a day, we want my time. We want to relax a little bit. And I don't think there's anything wrong with relaxing and recharging. Um, I think that's why God rested on the seventh day to show us, hey, it's okay to sit in the comfy chair. It's okay to relax and regain your energy. But what are we regaining that energy for? To go out to seek and to save the lost and to be a little bit uncomfortable and to give our time and our energy So what is our influence and what are we known for? We have, this, this church is approximately 900 members. Gary, if I'm right, 921, was that the last? Close. There's a lot of people here and that's awesome. There's still people in here I haven't met, I'm sorry. But this is a lot of people. We're in a town of approximately 20,000. You can correct me on that from all, I, I may be mistaken. We're in a town where we are approximately a 20th of the population. So let me ask you, do we have the impact that a 20th of the population can? If we were to go and poll a random person who does not have ties to here, who's maybe, who maybe possibly somehow doesn't know a lot of people here, and we say, hey, what do you, what is Glenn, what, what do you, tell me about Glendale Road Church of Christ. 
what do you know about that? Okay, what, what, how would you describe it? That's an awesome church. They love Jesus. They love people. They are out and about in their community. They are serving on a daily basis. What church? I've had that before. We're working, uh, meeting teens for the first time at, at schools. I'll say, hey, I'm Glenda. Like, what church is that? Well, or I, what I'm afraid of, a lot of times we ask these people, what did they say? Oh, that's the big church on the south side of town. When you first come into town, that big church on the right, that's, that's Glendale. Okay, what else? I don't know. Maybe they have a caring and sharing program, which is awesome. But do people know us as the big church building, or do people know us as the hands and feet of Jesus? Now, let me, let me clear something up. It's not about, it's, it's not about Glendale. I, I don't mean to, to, that to be offensive to people, but I don't, it's not about Glendale Road. I want people to know about the last name in our name, the last word in our name, and that's Christ. It's, it's not about the glory and honor of the Glendale Road congregation of the building, okay? It's about the glory and honor of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are the church of Christ, and we have got to be pointing people to Christ, or we are missing the picture, or, and we are not doing our job as, as Christians, So why aren't we sharing our faith? What, what is keeping us? Guys, Stephen is a decent preacher, all right? I've heard worse, I've heard better. Um, love you. He's pretty darn good. But expecting, but just inviting people to come to church and expecting them to, to come, hear a message, be like, oh, that's awesome. I need to, I need to hear, believe, repent, be baptized, and, and be a member of the church. After one sermon, that's wishful thinking. It's, I'm not saying it can't happen. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. That's awesome. But we can't just expect to hear people to invite people to this church building, them to hear a sermon, and then say, oh, this is it. I've got it figured out, okay? We've got to go out into the community. We've got to go and seek and save the lost. When, when you're lost, when, when, you need, when someone is, is lost and needs rescue, you, people go out and find them. That's, that's why they're lost, okay? So when we get people who don't know the gospel, we can't expect them to just walk in this building and say, oh, this is it. I got it. Finally found it. Whew. Why aren't we out there searching for them? Why aren't we out there looking for them and saying, hey, I've got awesome news, and it's Jesus. And we preach to them, we tell them that way, and then we get them here. And then they say, okay, what you've been talking about, it makes sense. This is what this book is talking about. But we, maybe we don't share it because it's not important to us. We're not excited about it, or, or we're scared to share it. If it's not important to you, and, and it's easy, let's, let's say it's easy to say it's important, right? It's easy to say God first. But I love what 1 John three eighteen says. It's the Bible's version of saying actions speak louder than words. John says, my little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Actions speak louder than words. And it's easy to say God is first. But if at the drop of a hat, anything else comes up on a Sunday morning or Wednesday night or a Sunday night and we're not here or you are making excuses, actions speak louder than words. Matthew 6, 33 says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Matthew 6, 24, 16, 24, Jesus says, you've got to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. One of the hardest things I think it is for us to do is to say no to Rob. Say no to me, right? We take care of ourselves. We want to do things for us. But Jesus says there, you've got to say no to yourself and follow me. And Paul backs that up in Galatians 2.20 saying, it's not about me. It's all about Jesus. He now lives in me and it's about him. So if you say it's important to you, you've got to back it up. You've got to realize it's not about me and you at all. It's about Jesus Christ. And, we've got, and when we put him first, he's going to take care of us. We've got to show that to others. Or if you're not excited about it, how often do you get, well, maybe not super often, but when you get something new, okay? A new phone, a new car, a new house, the you know, especially the house. That's the, that's the big Facebook post, right? First time home buyers. Everybody likes it. That's great. And it's awesome. It is a, a great feeling. But whenever we are, we're taking a trip, right? We're taking a trip. Um, we get something new. We're excited about it, right? And we share it and we want to tell everybody. We have the best news possible as Christians 
that Jesus Christ came to earth, he died for our sins, and he rose again so that we can have the hope of heaven, and we won't share it. We have it, but we'd rather tell people about our weekend trip than about Jesus. I really love the description that's in Acts chapter 3, verse 11. That says, now as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. How cool would it be if what we have to offer and what we share, people ran to the church building, okay? What if in the morning when they unlocked the doors that people were just lining up saying, I want to hear this good news, okay? I, I'm ready because I, I, that's not happening. Because I feel like our excitement doesn't match that level, okay? If you ever, someone told you something that's very exciting that gets you pumped up, you're like, yeah, I want to do that. But then someone's telling you, and they're like, hey, let me tell you this really cool thing. Well, I'm doing this. And you're like, oh, cool. Our excitement should, should bleed over, okay? Our excitement should go to other people. In Acts chapter 4, right after this story where they're running together, uh, Peter and John are arrested. They say, stop preaching about Jesus. And they say, we can't help but, but talk about what we've seen and heard. You can tell us to stop. We can listen. you got to judge whether it's right to listen to God or man, but we can't help it. Or maybe sometimes we're not excited because life is just rough, okay? And life isn't going that good, so it's hard, it's hard to be excited about something when you're depressed about everything, right? Or you're sad about things. I love this awesome news. Jesus says, these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. In this world, you will have problems. You will have trouble, but take heart. Be of good cheer. I, Jesus, have overcome the world. And if that doesn't excite you, that as all the bad things that get you down, we still have that hope in Christ that he's better and greater than all these things, that's got to put a smile on your face. That's got to excite you. Let's be honest. What's, what's big for a lot of us is you're scared or timid or however you want to put it, it's not always something that comes natural, especially in 2 Timothy chapter 2, where Paul tells Timothy in chapter or in 2 Timothy 3 verse 12, he says, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. This isn't a possibly, this isn't a maybe, you will suffer persecution. And we've already talked about, though, this is not the same persecution as the early church, uh, early church endured, but it's still gonna, we're still going to get mocked. We're still going to get made fun of. We're still going to be left out, especially speaking to teenagers. Some of the, the biggest thing is it's, it's not popular. And let's face it, as adults, it's not always popular, okay? So we don't talk about it as we should, but... Paul talks about Romans chapter 1. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It, is, it, is, it helps. It is salvation to everybody. And as he tells Timothy that you will be persecuted, a couple passages before, he says in verse 7 of chapter 1, he says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind, of self-control. God didn't say, hey, go do this, but good luck, you're scared. He said this is a, a spirit of boldness, of power. We have God's Holy Spirit who is able to utter things that we don't understand, who's able to help us in our times of need. <clears throat> Rob, I don't know the scriptures. I don't know what I'm talking about. What if they ask me a question? I don't know. Study to show yourself approved. And that's, that's on each and every one of us individually. But we can't make excuses, oh, they won't listen. Or, oh, what if they don't talk to me? Or, oh, this is an awkward situation. We've got to talk to them. It's got to be important to you. You've got to be excited about it. You can't be scared. You've, it's time to be uncomfortable. It's time to get out of the pews and to go out and share our faith. It's time to stop being okay with 900 people, okay? Because <clears throat> there are thousands and thousands more down the street <clears throat> who don't know Jesus, we, we get, sometimes it's like, oh, Rob, I was uncomfortable. I was in Haiti for a week. Have you ever done that? I haven't. I've been in Jamaica for a few weeks. Similar, hot, sticky, not very much AC, different food. But we got to get uncomfortable on a daily basis, okay? We can't say, I've checked off the mission trip for the year, or I've checked off that service project for this week. 
when 900 people are out and about being uncomfortable, taking their time and energy and going and being the hands and feet in this community, we're going to need a bigger church building. Or better yet, we're going to go plant another church there and plant a church here and plant a church here and where we have these, these bodies of Christ who are meeting together because these people are being reached by Jesus. But Jesus didn't preach a comfortable faith. Jesus didn't live a comfortable life. And I think it's unfair for us to expect to live a comfortable life and preach a comfortable faith when I don't believe that's what Scripture teaches. So church, let's go out. Let's be the hands and feet of Jesus. And let's be uncomfortable. If there's anything we can help you with this morning, we invite you to come as we stand and as we sing.